1633 and we aim to look at the history, at the content, at the biblical basis and at the obligation. Obviously this will only be a brief introduction uh, to what is a very uh, extensive subject. Now the extended awareness of this remarkable document among us will vary greatly. Some may be fairly familiar with it, others vaguely, and perhaps some not at all. So let us begin then with the history. Where did the Solemn League and Covenant come from? By August 1642, the civil war in England between the parliamentary forces and the troops of Charles I was underway. What is known as the Long Parliament had removed the High Church Episcopacy of Archbishop Lord. By Episcopacy we mean church government by a hierarchy including bishops uh, over a number of churches, uh, individual bishops governing other ministers uh, and office bearers. And uh, this had been uh, swept away but without any real replacement. The Parliament Parliament therefore called an assembly of ministers and selected members of the Lords and the Commons to settle the government of the Church of England and to revise the 39 Articles of the Church of England. So initially that was the purpose of the Westminster Assembly, to settle the government of the Church of England and to revise the 39 Articles. Many of the High Church and Episcopalian party did not appear, they didn't come, because the king at that time had forbidden the assembly. Meanwhile, the parliamentary forces had suffered serious reverses and needed Scottish help. Now, Scotland, uh, the Reformation had gained great, great pro progress in Scotland, Scotland had already entered into the National Covenant of Scotland in 1639. The English parliamentarians needed help from the Scots. They desired a league with Scotland, but the Scots wanted more than a league. Robert Bailey, uh, a Scottish minister who was later on to attend the Westminster Assembly, says in one of his letters, the English were for a civil league, we for a religious covenant. So the Scots were not willing to have simply a, a military agreement. Now the Scots had little to gain politically, but they wanted to use their position to help forward the reformation of the English church. And so the Solemn League and Covenant was drawn up by Alexander Henderson. He, uh, he as well would also be one of the Scottish representatives at the Westminster Assembly. And so in 1633 the Solemn League and Covenant was sworn uh, by both signed and with lifted up hands by the Westminster Assembly, the Houses of Parliament, and this taking of the Covenant, as it was called, was took place after worship and preaching by Philip Nye and Alexander Henderson from Scotland. Thereafter, this Solemn League and Covenant was signed by the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland and by the Scottish Parliament. It was also later signed and sworn by Charles II, who was King of England, Scotland and Ireland. It was then, it was also sworn and taken by large numbers of people in England and in Scotland and also in the north of Ireland in 1644. And uh, that's an interesting point in itself. In the spring of 1644, the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland sent four ministers to explain and preach uh, to preach and to explain the Solemn League and Covenant to the army and the people in the north of Ireland. 
At Carrickfergus, 1,000 soldiers and civilians swore the covenant. Large numbers gathered later on in Comber, Newtonard, Bangor, Broad Island, and Island McGee. Then later on, more gatherings listened to the preaching of the Scottish ministers and swore the covenant in Antrim, in Ballymena, and in Coleraine. And apparently in these places, after the worship had finished, the people stayed to sing psalms and to pray to Almighty God. Even after the long service had finished, they carried on singing psalms and in prayer to God. It was also sang at Billy and Dunluce in the Root, and at Londonbury, two of the Scottish ministers, William Adair and John Weir, met a considerable opposition from the mayor of Londonbury and Colonel, uh, what a man called Colonel Mervyn. But the crowds gathered in such numbers to listen to the preaching and to swear the covenant in the marketplace that these men were powerless to prevent it. Then in Rafu, in County Donegal, so great a crowd gathered to hear the preaching of the Scottish ministers that one man had to preach inside the church building and another of them preached outside because the building wouldn't hold all the people. The two ministers particularly involved in this uh, were uh, William Adair and uh, another man who I'll give you his name in a minute or two. But these two men uh, were preaching the word of God in these places, explaining the solemn league and covenant and those who wished to, and there were multitudes who did, swore the solemn league and covenant. They proceeded to Letter Kenny, and then to a place called Ray, and again, one of the ministers had to preach inside the building, one had to preach outside, so great were the multitudes ready to swear the solemn league and covenant. Uh, then they proceeded to a place called Taboon, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, and then to Enniskillen, where everyone except one con conforming minister swore the solemn league and covenant. They were, uh, one of the ministers went back uh, to uh, Derry Cathedral and observed the Lord's Supper. The altar was taken out for this observance of the Lord's Supper, and only those who seemed to be Christians were allowed to partake. There was also a great gathering at Bally Castle where more multitudes swore the solemn league and covenant. Then the ministers returned to the congregations of Antrim and Down, preaching and exhorting the people where they'd already been with the solemn league and covenant, and they were joined by a third minister, uh, James Hamilton, and then proceeded. Uh, to take communion services in Newton Arts, Hollywood and Ballywater before returning to Scotland. So there we have some account uh, of the effect and uh, how many took the Solemn League and Covenant in the north of Ireland, both in what became Northern Ireland uh, after the partition, but also in Donegal, large numbers swore the Solemn League and Covenant. And uh, there were also some in Dublin, I believe, who swore this Solemn League and Covenant, though small in number. So then, this covenant was signed by the Parliaments of England and Scotland. It was signed and sworn by uh, Charles II on two occasions and it was signed by multitudes in England, Scotland, and in the north of Ireland. Well now, what was the effect of this? As a result of the Solemn League and Covenant, the Westminster Assembly took on a new significance. First of all, there were Scots commissioners at the Westminster Assembly. That was a direct result of the Solemn League and Covenant. 
and the Scottish General Assembly sent ministers and ruling elders to the Westminster Assembly. They did that deliberately to get across to the English that Presbyterian Church government meant ministers and ruling elders governing the Church of God. The ministers who came from Scotland included Alexander Henderson, who was, as we saw earlier, the man who drafted the Solemn League and Covenant, Robert Bailey, who wrote the letters that are so useful in knowing what, was, what went on in the Westminster Assembly, and the other two men were Samuel Rutherford and George Gillespie, who made an immense contribution to the work of the Westminster Assembly. Although there were only those four ministers from Scotland at the Westminster Assembly, their influence far exceeded their proportionate numbers. But the other thing was that the scope of the Assembly's work was greatly increased. The 39 articles, instead of being revised, were set aside, and the Assembly's job was increased to cover four areas as set out in the Solemn League and Covenant. They were to produce a confession of faith, a form of church government, a directory for worship, and a catechism. There was to originally be one catechism. We ended up with two, the larger catechism and the shorter catechism, because as the Scots reported, uh, they could not dress up meat and milk in one dish. So the shorter catechism they regarded as the milk, and the larger catechism was the meat. The shorter catechism was for the young and the weak and ignorant. The larger catechism was for the mature. In God's providence then, it was the solemn league and covenant that resulted in the production of our doctrinal standards. It was the solemn league and covenant that in God's providence resulted in the production of the Westminster Confession, the Directory for Worship, the former church government, and the catechisms. If there had been no solemn league and covenant, then there would have been no catechism, for example. This should not be overlooked. Well, that's briefly a history. But then, secondly, the content of the Solemn League and Covenant. The content. It divides into six sections after the initial uh, prologue. Section 1 permits those who swore it to preserve the Reformed religion in Scotland in doctrine, worship, discipline, and government, and to seek the reformation of the Church in England and Ireland and the uniformity of the churches in England, Scotland, and Ireland in confession of faith, form of government, directly for worship, and catechizing. So they wanted the preservation of the reformed religion in Scotland, and they wanted the reform of the church in England and Ireland. That doesn't mean that the Scots were not willing to change on anything, but they did see the church in Scotland as closest to the biblical pattern and desire that England and Scotland would be brought into conformity and that they would have one confession of faith, one form of government, one directory for worship and uniformity in catechism. That's in section one. In section two, they commit themselves to seek the overthrow of all false religion and it mentions the extirpation of popery and prelacy. It does not say the extirpation of papists and prelatists simply because of their private views, but they did seek all lawful means to extirpate popery and prelacy. So that whatever power God had given to the church, whatever power God had given to the state, it was to be used to that end. Section 3 uh, commits those who swear it in their various callings to uphold the rights of the monarch, the king, and the parliaments and the citizens, especially loyalty to the monarch 
in his preserving and defending the true religion. Section 4 uh, indicates a commitment to opposition to all who oppose the reformation of church and state or all uh, seeking to foment division contrary to the covenant. So they commit themselves to oppose all who oppose the true religion in church and state and all who seek to divide uh, the covenanted people. Section 5 see, uh, commits them to seeking to maintain the union of the kingdoms. And section 6 commits them to mutual support all who have taken this covenant to support one another in seeking the aims of the covenant. Then at the end there is confession of sin and humiliation before God, profession of sincere desire and seeking the blessing of God. And it ends with a desire for other nations to come into this covenant or like covenant. That brings us thirdly to the biblical basis. The biblical basis. What is the biblical basis behind the Solemn League and Covenant. Does it have a biblical basis? First of all, the biblical basis of covenanting in general. When we consider covenanting with God, we must begin with God's covenant with men. God's covenant of grace in Christ. In his gracious covenant, God promises to be the God of his people in Christ Jesus. He binds himself by his own promise. So the Westminster Confession, chapter 7, section 3 says, And in the covenant he freely offereth unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him, that they may be saved, and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life, his Holy Spirit, to make them willing and able to believe. And through his covenant of grace, God says to those who are in Christ, Thou art my people. And they, by his grace, respond, in the words of Hosea 2.23, Thou art my God. So God, in the covenant, promises life to sinners requiring salvation requiring the, uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and he undertakes to regenerate the elect so that they are willing to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and the effect of God's covenant and its requirements being made known and the effect of sovereign grace in the hearts of the elect is that they say, Thou art my God. And when men individually and collectively truly covenant with God, it is simply the effect of God's grace in them causing them to embrace the promise addressed to them. In other words, covenanting with God is simply a more developed way of saying Thou art my God. God covenants with man and by his grace men covenant with God. It is the response of men brought about by the grace of God as he makes known his covenant to them. And so, covenanting with God is simply individuals or peoples declaring in response to God's grace to them that God is their God, either individually or collectively. Let's look at some biblical examples. We find the biblical examples particularly in times of crisis in the Old Testament. I'm going to give you Old Testament examples of covenanting. 
We make no apology for that. The Old Testament is the Word of God. Anything in the Old Testament not cancelled in the New stands. To believe otherwise is dispensationalism. What God has appointed or approved in the Old Testament, if it is not cancelled by God himself when we come into the New, it stands. Our first example is in Joshua chapter 24. Joshua 24. Joshua 24 and verse 16. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved, preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through, through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from, us, from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Therefore will we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. Verse 21, And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. Verse 24, And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and obey, and his voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Then turning to Second Chronicles and chapter 15. Second Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 12. Second Chronicles 15 verse 12. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. That whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting and with trumpets and with cornets. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire. And he was found of them, and the Lord gave them rest round about. Now, not all the circumstances are the same uh, in the New Testament, but the principle of covenanting continues. Second Kings chapter 11 and verse 17. Second Kings 11, 17. And Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the King and the people, that they should be the Lord's people, between the King also and the people. And in the days of Josiah, in Second Kings chapter 23, and verse 1 to 3, Second Kings 23, verse 1, And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem, and the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar, and made a covenant before the Lord, to walk after the Lord, and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and with all their soul to perform the words of this covenant and were, that were written in this book and all the people stood to the covenant. It's also mentioned in Second Chronicles chapter 34. Second Chronicles 34 and verse 31. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in this book. 
and he caused all that were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand to it and the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God the God of their fathers so they covenanted to keep God's covenant with them Nehemiah chapter 9 Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 32 Now therefore our God the great, the mighty and the terrible God who keepeth covenant and mercy let not all the trouble seem little before thee that hath come upon us on our kings, on our princes and on our priests and on our prophets and on our fathers and on all thy people since the time of the kings of Assyria unto this day then in verse 38 and because of all this we make a sure covenant and write it and our princes, Levites and priests seal unto it men covenant with God as a result of God covenanting with men but then having looked at covenanting in particular what is the biblical basis of the content of the solemn legal covenant if covenanting is right if it is right for individuals, families, churches, nations to swear and pledge themselves uh, to uh, fulfill their obligations to the Lord then what about the content of this particular covenant first of all the church in Matthew 28 and verse 19 we read the exalted Christ or the risen Christ giving instructions to his church Matthew 28 verse 19 Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo I am with you always even unto the end of the world Amen Christ is the king of the church therefore the church is to be governed in Christ's appointed manner so the solemn legal covenant is right to pledge the church to reform its government according to the word of God Christ as king of the church means that only those are to be admitted to the church whom he says should be admitted no more no less so the solemn legal covenant is right to pledge the church to maintain biblical discipline Christ's kingship over the church means that the worship of the church of God must be limited to those things which Christ approves in his word therefore the solemn legal covenant is right in pledging the church to worship according to the biblical pattern rather than in will worship as Colossians 2.23 speaks of worship that has its origin in what men want rather than what the word of God appoints because Christ is king and head of the church and the church is to be the pillar and ground of the truth 1 Timothy 3.15 that means that all that is taught in the church and by the church to others must be according to the word of God that the church must hold fast the form of sound words 2 Timothy 1 13 therefore it is right that the church should pledge itself uh, to hold the doctrine of the word of God and to maintain that doctrine and since the church is to be one under Christ one Lord one faith one baptism and since the people of God are to strive together for the faith of the gospel then the aim of uniformity in the churches of England Scotland and Ireland in confession of faith form of church government directory of worship and catechizing is scriptural of course the church should aim at uniformity there's only one God one saviour, one head of the church one bible, one appointed form of government one appointed form of worship one appointed discipline 
So then when we come to the state, no human activity can legitimately be undertaken in attempted independence of God and His Word. The idea that the state can be neutral is atheism. No human activity is neutral. And the idea that a nation can be governed in a, a neutral manner is nonsense. If the ruler of a nation is to attempt neutrality, he must behave in his actions of government like an atheist. And that's not neutrality, it's sin. The ruler of the nation is to punish evil. Who defines what evil is? Man is taking it upon himself within our nation to define what a human being is, to define what is and what is not murder, to decide on punishment on the grounds of his ability to know whether the person will reoffend, and so it goes on. All of this is not neutrality, it's sin, national sin against God. Civil government is not neutral. If the ruler of a nation is to punish evil within the limited power given to him by God in his word, then it must be evil as defined by God in his law. Not all sin is crime. It certainly is difficult to define when sin should be treated as crime. But the starting point is the law of God as defining right and wrong. And it is transgressions of that law that become public and matters of crime that the civil ruler is to punish. Rulers are to acknowledge Christ, the Prince of the Kings of the Earth, Revelation 1, 5. Romans 13, 4 says that the civil ruler is a minister of God. He acts as God's minister. Psalm 2 gives an exhortation, an admonition to civil rulers. Psalm 2 and verse 10. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings, be instructed ye judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and he perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Now that warning to rulers is not just saying that kings and judges in the earth should repent of their personal sin and trust Christ but go on behaving as rulers exactly as they are now. No. Personal repentance and a conversion to Christ will entail a difference, a radical change in the way that they rule as kings and rulers. The idea that if a ruler trusts Christ it will make no difference to the way he governs is of course ludicrous. The fruits of repentance must be seen in his personal life and his public and official life as well. Church and state are distinct, but both in their appointed rules must submit to Christ. The church is to administer the ordinances appointed to the church, the preaching of the word, the sacraments, the discipline, uh, and the worship of God. The state is to own Christ's authority over them by judging and punishing according to the law of God. And the solemn league and covenant commits those who swear it to seek Christ being acknowledged as king in both church and state 
as well as in their own individual and family lives. So the solemn league and covenant is biblical in its content. Fourthly, obligation. Obligation. First of all, the extent of obligation. We read Joshua chapter 9. And in that passage, you will see that the oath that was sworn uh, by Joshua and the leaders of the people was binding because the thing was lawful. The only oaths that are non-binding are oaths which commit us to sin. If in our sinfulness we take an oath that commits us to, com to doing that which is sinful, then we are to repent of the oath, not commit the sin required by it. That's why Luther, for example, did not regard himself as bound by his uh, vows to the Roman Catholic priesthood. So it's not only if the covenant binds to what is required in Scripture anyway, but anything that it binds us to that is not, that is not contrary to Scripture. You see, there is a view that only what is scriptural can be binding. Only duties actually commanded in scripture can be regarded uh, in the content of a covenant as binding. But in fact, the scriptural position is that anything in a covenant that those who swore it uh, uh, are committed to Anything that is not sinful or contrary to scripture is binding. So John Godfrey, preaching in 1663, said this, that we take the covenants in this place to be of man's duties in the land, and for keeping them the better, we take an oath upon us in things that are neither neither morally evil nor good but indifferent but a man once engaged by oath cannot retract though they be not commanded duties yet once entered into they must stand for when we open our mouths to the Lord we cannot go back so not only were the swearers of this covenant not only did they regard themselves as bound to do the things in it that scripture required anyway, but everything in it that was not contrary to scripture they regarded as binding. The second question is, who are obliged by it? Who are obliged by it? Well, first of all, the original swearers are obliged by it. That's obvious in Joshua 9 that the princes of the people were bound by their oath concerning the Gibeonites. And Psalm 15 verse 4 which we were singing, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not is commended. But then secondly, the body of people represented by those who swore it are bound by it. If you turn to Joshua chapter 9 again, Joshua chapter 9 and verse 18, And the children of Israel smote them not, that's the Gibeonites, because the princes of the congregation had sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel, and all the congregation murmured against the princes. But all the princes said unto all the congregation, We have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Now therefore we may not touch them. So the people were bound by the oath of their leaders. Otherwise no covenant or binding agreement by leaders of a people would be worth anything if only the leaders were themselves were personally bound by it. And so Joshua and the princes of the people didn't say, well, we swore it, so we not touch them, but you didn't, so you can kill them. They said, we cannot touch them. 
because they had sworn to the Lord. Thirdly, subsequent generations of those people may be bound. Those who first swore the solemn league and covenant intended that it should bind them and future generations. So in section 1, that we and our posterity after us may live as, bre lay as brethren, live in faith and love. Section 5, that they, that is the kingdoms, may remain conjoined in a firm peace and union to all posterity. And so James Guthrie, on the scaffold before he was martyred for the faith, declared that no person or power on earth could loose or dispense the covenants that they were still binding on the three kingdoms and would be forever hereafter. And then he cried, The covenants, the covenants, shall yet be Scotland's reviving before he was put to death for his faith. Is that biblical? Turn to Second Samuel chapter 21. Second Samuel chapter 21. And verse 1 and 2. Then there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. So Saul's house was held guilty for the slaying of the Gideonites, not only because of the action itself, but because it was a breaking of the oath taken by the leaders of Israel four centuries before, hundreds of years previously. If we turn to Deuteronomy chapter 29, Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 10. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 10. You stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, your elders and your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and thy stranger that is in thy camp, from the fuel of thy wood unto the drawer of thy water, that thou shouldest enter into covenant with the Lord thy God, and into his oath, which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, and that he may be unto thee a God, as he hath said unto thee, and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. And there's an evident reference there to subsequent uh, generations being bound by the covenant. Thirdly, they are bound by this covenant who took it rashly, insincerely, and under coercion. They are bound by this covenant even if taken rashly, insincerely, or under coercion. Joshua and the princes swore unadvisedly and rashly. We're told in Joshua 9 they sought not counsel of the law. But though they did it rashly, though they did it foolishly, though they did it as a result of trickery by the Gibeonites, yet they were bound by the oath that they made to the Lord. It stood. 
even though the Gibeonites had deceived them, even though they had rashly acted in taking it, in making that oath, it stood. And it stood for them, it stood for the people as a whole, and it stood for subsequent generations. Then if you turn to Second Chronicles, chapter 36, and verse 13. Second Chronicles 36 and verse 13. Speaking of Zedekiah the king. And he also rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God that he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. So Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had made Zedekiah swear by God. But then Zedekiah rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. You might think, well, the Lord wouldn't mind. But if you turn to Ezekiel 17 and verse 12, you find it is otherwise. Verse 11, Ezekiel 17, 11, Moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Say now to the rebellious house, Know ye not what these things mean? Tell them, Behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem, and hath taken the king thereof, and the princes thereof, and led them with him to Babylon, and hath taken of the king's seed, and made a covenant with him, and hath taken an oath of him. He hath also taken the mighty of the land, that the kingdom might be based, that it might not lift itself up, but that by keeping up his covenant, it might stand, but he rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors into Egypt, that they might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? Shall he escape that do such things? Or shall he break the covenant and be delivered? As I live, saith the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwelleth, that made him king, whose oath he despised, and whose covenant he break, and great company made for him in the wall by casting up mounts and building forts to cut off many persons seeing he despised the oath by breaking the covenant when lo he had given his hand and had done all these things he shall not escape therefore thus saith the Lord God as I live surely mine oath that he has despised and my covenant that he hath broken even it will I recompense upon his own head. The oath that Zedekiah made to the king of Babylon in the name of the Lord under coercion was regarded uh, by God as binding upon Zedekiah. Having said that, Ireland was the place where the solemn league and covenant was taken with no coercion. Well, that wasn't entirely true in England and Scotland, but if there was one place where it was sworn without coercion, it was the northern part of Ireland. We are constrained, therefore, to conclude that the solemn league and covenant, unless it can be shown to be sinful in any of its requirements, that the solemn league and covenant is entirely binding on this generation also. That brings us finally, and I'll not give you much longer, the present position. But first of all, what happened to it? What happened to the Solemn League and Covenant? In Scotland, by the time of the revolution under King William, the Solemn League and Covenant was virtually forgotten. The continuing covenantal remnant in Scotland, later known as the Reformed Presbyterian Church, dissented from the revolution settlement and because it ignored the National Covenant of Scotland and the Solemn League and Covenant. There were other things. The revolution settlement allowed unrepentant Episcopalians, compromisers, and even persecutors to hold office in the Church of Scotland. The Revolution Settlement 
gave the state an interference, a right of interference in the church. In the, this is in the Church of Scotland, never mind the Church of England, where the monarch is head of the church. In the Church of Scotland, from the Revolution Settlement onwards, there was a right given to the civil authorities to interfere in the church. That right increased and led to several later secessions from the Church of Scotland. Prelacy or episcopacy, government by a hierarchy in the church, was allowed in England. Presbyterianism was allowed in Scotland because of its popularity, not because it was of divine right. In other words, the revolution of 1688, though it brought much good and delivered the Covenanters from much of their sufferings, yet the settlement that was brought in fell woefully short of the biblical high ground of the Solemn League and Covenant. That Solemn League and Covenant was ignored from then on. That's Scotland. But what about in Ireland? In the 1650s, candidates for ordination had to declare their adherence to the Solemn League and Covenant in the Presbyterian Church of Ireland. In the 1670s, there was an evident parting of the ways as most of the Presbyterian ministers quietly forgot about the Solemn League and Covenant so as not to provoke the king who didn't like it. But with the exception, there were exceptions. Michael Bruce of Kalinchy, John Cruikshanks of Raffaud, Andrew McCormack of Maharali. These men continued to preach and to teach at great risk to themselves the continuing obligation of the Solemn League and Covenant in their preaching. The last two mentioned died in the Battle of Rullion Green in Scotland. Between 1670 and 1681, Alexander Peden repeatedly visited the northern part of Ireland in order to encourage the people of God who had who held to the continuing obligation of the Solemn League and Covenant. Ultimately, the only minister left residing in Ireland who would not keep silent concerning the obligation of the Solemn League and Covenant was David Houston. James Rennick, who was to die for the faith in Scotland, in a letter writes this, As for Mr. David Houston, he carries very straight. I think him both learned and zealous. He seems to have much of the spirit of our early professors, for he opposes much by passing from any part of our testimony and sticks close to every form and order whereunto we have attained. When it's thought highly of Houston, and I like that phrase, As for Mr. David Houston, he carries very straight. Other men were letting the Solemn League and Covenant be forgotten. Houston didn't. And it is the people who adhered to Houston who in due time became the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Ireland. Notice The division between the Presbyterian Church of Ireland and the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Ireland came about, first of all, over the Presbyterians abandoning the Solemn League and Covenant. Nothing that the Reformed Presbyterian Church held to was new. They just didn't want to abandon what they had. But at the first division was over the Solemn League and Covenant. And for many, many years, the Presbyterian Church of Ireland and the Reformed Presbyterian Church held to the Westminster Confession and Catechisms, sang only the Psalms without instrumental accompaniment. The first difference was over the Solemn League and Covenant. The Presbyterian Church 
uh, introduced it novelties in worship and in doctrine at a much later stage. So the Reformed Presbyterian Church does not stand for anything that was not part of the original Presbyterian position. What about present application? We must maintain the biblical goals of the Solemn League and Covenant in church and state. We must use all our powers, including the use or non-use of the elective franchise, only in a manner compatible with those goals, however far off they may seem from being attained. We must recognize that the Solemn League and Covenant was the means of passing down to us the excellent Westminster Confession and Catechisms that we have. And we must still desire the three kingdoms to be in a union under Christ the King over church and state in all three. In a recent issue of the Messenger magazine, the magazine of the young people of the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Ireland, there is a very interesting quotation. It's from a letter sent by the Synod of the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Ireland to the American Reformed Presbyterian Synod in 1922. And it reads as follows. The great betrayal of Ulster by the British government is one of the basest and most sordid acts ever committed by any government. But it is the natural outcome of a Christless constitution, the natural and necessary sequence of the many concessions made to Romish demands. But a handful of rebels in Ireland should thwart the might of Britain is a puzzle for the whole world. The Stormont Agreement and its miserable outworking, which we are witnessing at present, is simply a further step in the same process. Without the grace of God producing willing submission to the Word of God, neither church nor state leaders know what they are doing or why. They don't know how to govern because they are not themselves owning the government of the Lord over them. Let us pray then for a day when multitudes will be converted to Christ personally and when individuals families, church and state in these islands and beyond will say the Lord is our King and the Lord is our Lawgiver. The postscript contains some facts not covered in the address. The four Scottish ministers who came to tender the solemn reading and covenant in Ireland were William Adair, James Hamilton, John Weir, and Hugh Henderson. The travels referred to in the foregoing address were those of Adair and Weir. When, the men, when these men preached at the signing of the covenant in Derry, their texts were 2 Chronicles 15 verse 15, Jeremiah 1 verse 5, and Nehemiah 9 verse 10. They showed the sinfulness of the black oath requiring complete submission to the king and many showed much sorrow in repenting of it with tears. This, so this sorrow for former compromises was a feature of many of the meetings uh, for the signing of the Solemn League and Covenant. Okay.